Well, there you have it. That's a two-cylinder, 950cc Saturn engine. That doesn't even make any sense! Yeah, I get it. It still looks like a four-cylinder engine. And if you count the spark plugs, let's see, one, two, three, and four. So it's technically still a four-cylinder. But in this case, we've deactivated two of the cylinders. And now, well, we're calling it a two-cylinder engine. Welcome back to Robot Cantina. Today we're going to ask that you pay attention and perhaps drink that extra cup of coffee. We have all sorts of shenanigans in store for you, and we go way beyond what we indicate in the title and thumbnail. Today's experiments will be cylinder deactivation, and let's see how far we can take this concept. So this video was suggested by one of our viewers, and it's an interesting experiment to see how much power we can lose and if the car will still be drivable. We'll also check the fuel economy and find out if it's possible to save a little on gasoline. Cylinder deactivation is something that's done on modern larger engines and it's been around since the early 80s when Cadillac tried it unsuccessfully. Of course, cylinder deactivation, or sometimes called variable displacement, is done automatically as the car is driven. For today's experiment, we will mechanically deactivate the cylinder and it will stay deactivated throughout the test. And that's because it's impossible to build an active variable displacement engine on a YouTube budget. So the theory is, the deactivated cylinders will no longer be able to draw in and compress air, and this will remove a lot of drag on the engine. But it's not perfect, and there'll still be some losses. But this is more or less how it's done on real systems, except they activate and deactivate automatically. I have some concerns about my methods, and we're going to test this concept out on our parts car before we try it on the good car. Now our parts car has problems of its own. The main problem, of course, is the fuel pump doesn't work. Well, that sucks, but we were able to get the car running with a lawnmower carburetor. And if you watched our previous video, we tested the lawnmower carburetor on the good car as well. Now this is interesting. By reading the comments on the previous video, some folks claimed that I copied Thunderhead 289, and I absolutely did. I gave Luke credit for the idea, but you wouldn't know it from some of the comments. Anyway, today we're going to do something different, and we'll first try it out on the parts car that still has a carburetor on it. However, if this concept works, we'll test it out on the good car that has a functioning fuel injection system. The first experiment we're going to try is to mechanically deactivate two cylinders and see if the engine will even run, and to see if we still have oil pressure. So to mechanically deactivate two of the cylinders, we'll need to remove four rocker arms and four hydraulic lifters. And we'll need to plug the lifter holes so we don't lose too much oil pressure. Of course, if this engine had a working fuel injection system, we'd also need to disconnect the fuel injectors. This guide plate keeps the lifters oriented correctly. Without this plate, the rollers on the lifters would destroy the camshaft and the cylinder head pretty quickly. So this is one of the hydraulic lifters, and I'm not sure if it matters, but we noted the direction of the oil feed holes so we can put the engine back together correctly when we finish the experiment. And of course, this is the roller which rides directly on the camshaft. For now, we'll put the lifter back in the engine. We will eventually need to pull out these four lifters, but first I want to temporarily store the lifters so we can put everything back together the way we found it. It's important not to mix up the parts because they've sort of worn into place and even though the parts are interchangeable, mixing them can accelerate the engine wear after we put the engine back together. A common solution to keep the parts in order is to poke them through a piece of cardboard. It's free and it's simple. Now this last lifter, we'll use this to engineer a 3D model so we can print something to fill the lifter cavity with. And that's so we can maintain oil pressure in the engine. You see, without the hydraulic lifters in place, there'd be a massive oil leak inside the engine and we'd likely destroy the engine. So that's the lifter plug. We printed these one at a time because the 3D printer was having problems due to how hot it was in the studio. We now need to print some caps to hold these in place. For this print, we'll print all four caps at once. Now, all the parts are printed in ABS plastic, and this stuff can handle the temperatures we expect to see inside the engine. So this is the finished lifter plug. We designed it with O-rings to help keep the oil feed sealed. Of course, this is just a plug and won't ride on the camshaft. Overall, it came out perfect. So now we can install the lifter plugs into the guide plate with a few stainless steel screws. We printed the plugs with holes just big enough for the screws to self-tap into the plastic.
Now, before we can put the engine back together, we need to remove the rocker arms. Off camera, I marked the rocker arms so we can put them back in the same location later. These rocker arms have needle bearings that get lubricated from the oil splashing around, and they don't have a direct oil feed. So now we can reassemble the engine. Let's see if the engine will still run. Right away I can detect the engine's a little bit sluggish, but it's running. So we deactivated cylinder 2 and 3, and this will allow the engine to be semi-balanced. And judging by the idle, it seems like this is fairly smooth. So let's do a quick test around the yard. Now keep in mind this is our parts car. The fuel tank for the carburetor is loosely balanced on the roof of the car. Oh yeah, the car also has a screwed up automatic transmission that's stuck in third or fourth gear. Although reverse seems to work fine. Now believe it or not, this car is completely floored. Let's see how fast this thing will go at full throttle. Yeah, it's not fast, but like I said, it's stuck in third or fourth gear. Now off camera, we ran the engine for well over an hour and nothing bad happened. So let's do a review. It runs. It has oil pressure. I reckon we need to transfer this system to the good Saturn and do some road testing. These rocker cover bolts are actually shoulder bolts, and it's okay to use the impact driver on them. Normally, you don't want to use power tools to install the rocker cover. Off camera, we disconnected the fuel injectors for the two deactivated cylinders. Let's see if it runs. Well, not too bad. The electronic fuel injection seems to be cooperating, but no doubt there will be codes. Eh, that's par for the course. I'm pretty excited to take this hoopty out for a ride. It'll be interesting to see how it performs.
around town at low speeds, the performance is noticeably off a bit, but the car is drivable. The exhaust note is a lot louder and raspier too. The car cruises okay, but you do have to keep your foot on the accelerator. Let's see how long it takes to get this car up to 60 miles per hour. After the 0 to 60 test, we topped off the fuel tank and took the car out for a ride. We managed to put down 162 miles with the two cylinder engine, and that should be enough to accurately calculate the fuel economy. So, with two cylinders deactivated, meh, you really have to keep your foot on the accelerator so as not to impede the flow of traffic. Of course, we got a check engine light, so let's see what the complaint is. Well, we got a PO404. That's indicating that there's something wrong with the EGR system. On Saturns, that's actually a common code. It may be related to our experiment, and it may not. For now, I think we'll be okay. The next code is a PO300. Well, the ECU has detected a random misfire. I got news for you, buddy. It's not random. Anyway, this code is directly related to our experiment, and we can ignore it. However, normally a misfire code should be investigated right away. Let's see how this engine runs with three cylinders active and one cylinder deactivated. Restoring cylinder number two for a total of three active cylinders, well, the idle's a little choppy and we have a minor lifter tick. The good news is, the lifter tick is normal and that should go away after a while. I'm really not sure why the engine burned a little bit of oil on startup, but that went away after the engine warmed up. So now we have a 1425cc three cylinder engine with the number three cylinder deactivated. Let's go out for a ride.
I have to say, with the three cylinder version it has more power, but the engine also sounds terrible. Also it's a bit finicky on what gear you put the transmission in. For instance at 50 miles per hour, in fourth gear the engine will start bucking at part throttle. Now keep in mind, three cylinder engines are a lot more common these days, and this of course is a four cylinder engine with one cylinder deactivated. The firing order and the balancing is not ideal in our experiment, but this is what it is. Let's see how fast this can accelerate to 60 miles per hour. After the acceleration run, we topped off the fuel tank and took the car out for a fuel economy test. Driving this car with three cylinders is annoying to say the least. I'm not sure if it's the sound or the vibrations, but it wasn't a pleasant ride. We managed to put down 140 miles with only three cylinders operating. The extra power was greatly appreciated, but the vibrations made it a very miserable ride. I was glad to return to the studio. Now, let's see what else we can do to this car. So I know what you're thinking. Why not try running the engine on one cylinder? Eh, sure, why not? How bad could it be? Off camera, we disconnected the fuel injectors. <laughs> wow, it started. I was sort of hoping it wouldn't run. Well, I reckon we need to take it out for a ride. So with one cylinder active, this car is a real slug. Now there's a huge delay with throttle input as the engine has to wind up. And that makes sense with all the rotational mass hanging on the crankshaft. Just for giggles, let's see how fast we can get this thing to accelerate with a 475cc one cylinder engine. Well, <laughs> well, there you have it. This car is officially slower than our street legal go-kart. I'm not even sure it'll get to 60 miles per hour.
top speed turns out to be 51 miles per hour, but there was something odd going on with the engine. I'm not sure if the ECU was having trouble sorting stuff out, but the engine would lose power at wide open throttle and ran best at 80% throttle. These sort of things can happen when you do stupid stuff, and we like to do stupid stuff. Well, unfortunately this car is not drivable with one cylinder. I mean, it moves, you can clearly see that in a video, and on the back roads, it'll pick up speed eventually. But there's no way I'm going to drive this thing anywhere but back to the studio. Then we can review the data, including fuel consumption. So we make all sorts of videos, and I do get comments from time to time, and they sometimes ask, what is the purpose of the video? Well, this video has two goals. The first goal is to evaluate performance when a cylinder is deactivated. The second goal is to see if deactivating a cylinder will improve fuel economy. Now raise your hand if you thought deactivating a cylinder would improve performance. Anyone? Oh, I see someone back there. I think he's scratching his head. Yeah, he is. Oh, okay. Well, let's take a look at the performance results first. So this car tips the scale at 2100 pounds plus the driver and fuel. Now I do have to qualify these results. This is data that we collected at the Hillbilly Proving Grounds and your results may vary. With all four cylinders active, the 1900cc engine makes approximately 100 horsepower at 5500 RPM. Now this engine's a bit tired and I'd be surprised if it made 85 horsepower on a good day. Anyway, with all four cylinders active, we got the car up to 60 miles per hour in 13.96 seconds, and that was done in the previous video. Of course, some of you folks noticed that during that run, I shift the transmission rather slow. And yeah, that's true. The problem was, and still is, the clutch on this car is dragging, and it doesn't disengage fully unless you absolutely smash your foot way down on the floorboard, and then it still drags a little bit. Anyway, that affects performance, no doubt. Now when we deactivated one cylinder and reduced the engine displacement to 1425 cc, we got the car up to 60 miles per hour in 22.96 seconds. So that's about 9 seconds slower. It's hard to say how much power we lost, but I'm going to guess that the engine was making something like 50 to 60 horsepower. So deactivating two cylinders reduced the engine displacement to 950 cc's. And aside from the lack of power, the two-cylinder ran better than the three-cylinder. It's crazy. Anyway, with only two cylinders, we got the car up to 60 miles per hour in 34.54 seconds. That's 20 seconds slower than the four-cylinder engine and 11 seconds slower than the three-cylinder. I estimate with only two active cylinders, the engine was making something like 25 to 30 horsepower. And again, that's just a guess. Now, with three cylinders deactivated, well, it turns out that 60 miles per hour is not achievable. I'm not really sure if the ECU freaked out, but the engine wouldn't make any power at wide open throttle. I had to pull back on the accelerator to gain more speed. Anyway, top speed was 51 miles per hour. However, we like round numbers. So, 0 to 50, well, that took almost 2 minutes and 11 seconds. So that's very interesting. Now let's take a look at the fuel economy. With all four cylinders active, the little red Saturn eked out 42 miles per gallon with all expressway driving. The speeds ranged from 65 to 70 miles per hour. Now, unfortunately, it was deemed unsafe to drive the modified Saturn on the expressway, so we generated a new route. Let's take a look. So this is a 30-mile loop that's pretty much out in the middle of nowhere, Kansas. Now keep in mind, we didn't hypermile the car, we drove it with purpose, and what I mean to say by that is, we drove it like a normal person would. We didn't beat on it, but at the same time, we didn't do any tricks to improve the mileage. We didn't stick to this route 100%, and a few times we missed our turns here and there. You know, everything kind of looks the same out in the middle of nowhere, Kansas. Overall, the car wasn't pushed too hard on this route, though. So with three active cylinders, we drove a total of 140 miserable miles and netted 40.01 miles to the gallon. Interesting. Now with two cylinders active, the ride was more pleasant even though we had less power on tap. Anyway, we put down 162 miles and achieved 41 miles to the gallon. Oh yeah, the one cylinder Saturn. Meh, we'll never know. I can almost guarantee you the results would not have been good. Case closed on that one. So this was an interesting experiment, and of course there's a lot to consider. I'm fascinated with the results from the two-cylinder engine. I mean, the performance sucked, and that's a no-brainer, 
but the fuel economy surprised me. I really didn't think it would do so well. Anyway, fuel economy is important, and I'm certain some drivers could have squeezed out a bit more from this car. But here's my problem with that. I drove the car like a normal person would, and I'm reporting real-world results. Now, it's certainly possible to do all sorts of hypermiling tricks and squeeze out better fuel economy, but that's not realistic. I'm going to say, yep, there's room for improvement, but it's limited to the folks who do that sort of thing. For the rest of us, well, it was just a fun experiment. Next time on this channel, we're going to copy the two-stage lean burn system that was used on the iconic Honda Insight and implement it on the Saturn. It should be an interesting experiment to say the least. I'm really looking forward to doing this and I hope you folks come back and join us. Now is the time to consider subscribing and if you would, click on the like button. It really helps us out. Of course, if you have a comment, feel free to post it. Well, I reckon I have to put this back together now. Now what? That's stupid, it'll never work. All right. I'll be damned, it does work.